I'm John Buchanan, and in this video, we're going to explore all of the ways in which you can export stems from your logic projects. Now, before we go any further, let's just find out what stems are. Think about whatever you want the next stage of your project to be. If you have finished the writing and production and mixing stages of your project, and what you want to do is to render a stereo version of your track to put on uh, social media accounts or upload to streaming platforms, you're going to need the bounce button and to create a stereo mix of your track. But it could be that what you want to do is to create stems so that someone else can take the production on or remix it or use just a couple of elements of your track to build a whole new production. In which case, rather than the entire stereo mix, what that person is likely to want is all of the individual pieces of your track. Now, this brings us to the first question. How many pieces do you want to give them? Do you want to give them all of the drum parts separately, a separate kick, snare, closed hi-hat, open hi-hat, drum mix, type of arrangement where every single sound is separated on its own audio file, or do you want to give them a stem called drums, which contains all of those things? The answer is, what do they want? Do they want your kick drum separated from everything else? So that's a conversation that you would have with whoever you're collaborating with. But we're going to look at all of the ways, go as deep as we can into all of the ways in which we can export stems. Okay, so before we do that, let's just have a listen to the track that we're going to be working to. If you've watched this channel, you're going to recognize this tune. But what I've done in preparation for this is to organize it a little bit. Now, I've done that in a couple of ways. Firstly, I've done it with colors. Someone asked on the channel about whether or not I use colors. Oh yes, all the time in every single project I work on because it's a really useful way of being able to come back and find out which sounds are where. So my drums are blue, my synths are pink, the um, keyboard sounds are brown, the basses are purple, the brass part is a kind of brassy color, and in this particular project, I've made the guitars all green. So working from top to bottom, I can see that from a color perspective, I know exactly what's what, but you can see that I've also put the tracks next to each other. Now, it could be that while you're working, the last thing you add is your percussion part, and so when you're building your project, percussion is right down here at the bottom. Remember in Logic, when you finish the mix, it's really easy to move things around and put them where you want them to so that they can be next to each other. And we're going to see a little bit later in the video while that might be why that might be useful. Okay, enough chatting from me. Track sounds like this. Okay, so there's the track as it exists right now. So let's start with an absolutely deep stemming process. Let's imagine that the person that we're collaborating with wants every individual sound within our mix. Well, just before we begin the process of exporting it, let's find out exactly what that means. Obviously, we can see the individual tracks that are playing back right now, but within the mixer, what I'm also going to discover is that I've got a reverb, which is here on bus number one, and I've got a delay. Now, in order to have these be part of my project, in other words, in, uh, in order to print a stem of those effects, I need to make them part of my track. We'll see why in just a moment. But it's also worth bearing in mind that if you have set up effects like this, where a reverb is being fed from, let's say, some of the drum sounds and some of the pianos and some of the guitars, effectively what you're going to do when you print the reverb is that it's going to have those instruments in it all summed together. In other words, there isn't going to be a way of separating the piano reverb from the drum reverb from the guitar reverb. The reverb is just going to get printed as one file. There is a way that we can separate it, and we'll come to that in a little while, but in this version of this export, I'm going to end up with any summed effects effectively sharing the sounds that are feeding them. Now, what I'm going to do is to select this reverb track and I'm going to control click it and select create track. And what that's going to do is to put my reverb into my project. It's going to create an active track for it. 
Well, I'm going to do the same thing for the delay so that effectively what that's going to do is to bring my effects into my project as if they were active tracks, which of course they are. They're part of my mix. Then what I'm going to do is to select the top track, hold down shift and select the bottom one. I'm then going to come to file and then I'm going to come to export. And of all of the options available to me, one of them is to create 18 tracks as audio files. Now, be careful. You don't want 31 regions as audio files. That's going to take every region that's on the screen and bounce it as its own audio file. And that's no good to you because how on earth are you going to know where, let's say, the shaker parts all start? There are going to be five separate regions of those and it won't be obvious which one is supposed to go where. When we're opening up stems that have been created for us, what we want to be able to do is to put all of them at the same point, press play, and know that all of those tracks are going to play back together as the track was intended to be put together. So I'm going to select the 18 tracks as audio files option, and this is going to produce a dialog box. It's going to put it in the bounces folder for the project that I'm working on. That's the first thing to know. And I've got a few things that I can do which are really going to help me. So for a start, what it's going to do is to say, okay, what's the range of each file? And the option that I've selected here is to trim the silence at the file end. Okay, so what that basically means is, let's suppose I've got a sub bass that plays in the intro and then never plays again. If I'm not careful, I'm going to end up with an audio file that's maybe three minutes long or five minutes long or 11 minutes long if you're making Progressive House, where effectively the sub bass that plays in the first 16 bars and then never plays again generates a file that's 11 minutes long. I don't need it. I just need to know that it starts in the right place. And as soon as that sound has stopped playing and isn't going to come back, the file ends. That's a really useful feature and I would recommend it. Then what we can do is to change the file format to WAV files if we want. And what I can also do is to select the bit depth that I want as well. I've got an opportunity to render all of these without the effects plugins if I like. Now you might be thinking, yeah, what's the right option? Well, again, talk to whoever you're collaborating with. Do they want the effects that you've used on your tracks to be printed as part of them? Or do they just want the dry original signals? Definitely if there was a vocal in this track and if I was remixing someone's track and it was covered in reverb and reverse delays and all kinds of things, I'd probably want the dry original one because the affected reverb would be too compromised in terms of what I could go on and do with it. So that's a conversation for you and whoever you're collaborating with. And similarly, um, if I want to, I can include the audio tail, which means that any effects that have got a legacy to them, I'm going to make sure that they're included within the audio files. I've got an opportunity to include volume and pan information. So I've got a sound that fades in with an audio sort of um, uh, lift or volume riser as far as um, automation is concerned. I can decide whether to include that or bypass it so that it becomes the collaborator's choice whether or not to include that or not. So you can go through the various options here and decide which ones are valuable to you. Now then, in terms of normalizing, don't. Okay, so definitely don't normalize your files. What that's going to do is take every single file and it's going to render it and then it's going to turn its volume up to maximum, which is going to completely destroy the volume back, uh, sort of balance of your mix. Now you might decide to use overload protection. That means that if any sounds just are creeping above that magic line where suddenly they turn into the red, Logic's going to look after those and make sure that they don't overload. If you're confident that none of your track is overloading, then of course you can just select off there. Definitely don't normalize them. Promise me you won't. Okay, and then what I can do is either add some custom text. So I could put the name of my track in here and then each individual sound will be named with the track. Or alternatively, what I can do is to just print it and I can see that the first track is going to be called Reverb because that's the name of the track. So the drums, annoyingly, are going to be called Solaris rather than drums, but that's my fault because I didn't label the track. When I'm ready, I can press export. And what Logic's going to do is it's going to go through the track really quickly if you think about the amount of information information that it is sort of trying to process and it's going to then print a file. Now it's going to go all the way to the end of the project. It doesn't matter whether or not you put a cycle region around the area that you're printing to, it will just ignore it and keep going all the way to the end anyway. That doesn't mean that it's going to have printed audio files that go all the way to the end of bar 65 in this particular case, and we'll see that right now. So there we go, it's finished. What I'm then going to do is to come to my bounces folder, which is ready. I've opened it up ready for these individual files, and I can see all of the file names that have been created as a result of that bounce. So if I select them all and bring them into new tracks within my project down here at the bottom, 
I should be able to line them all up at bar one. I want to create new tracks for them and I'm gonna press OK. Now what I'm also gonna do is to solo them because I don't want the original track to play back at the same time as the audio. And we can see straight away that, sure enough, some of the sounds that maybe only play right at the start, their audio files are shorter than the ones that have still got sounds going on at the end. But that's okay because I don't need this old school keys effect to run all the way through if it's finished by bar 10. Now, one thing that I think is probably going to be true is that even though I didn't normalize these files, I think the mix is gonna be louder now that all of these tracks are at zero, whereas everything else has come in. You can see um, in order to get the volume balance right, it's uh, a lot of the faders are a lot quieter than that. So in order that you're not going to listen to a distorted mix on the playback, I'm just gonna take everything down by 9 dB or so. Let's have a listen to how it sounds. Okay, so that's worked really nicely. You can see that it's incredibly straightforward. We just put all of those tracks in at the beginning and everything's ready to go and we're good. So that's a really good option if I want every single track printed individually. What if I don't? Okay, well that's next. So let's unsolo those. What I'm gonna do is to get rid of all of those audio files. I'm also gonna get rid of the tracks that I've put them on. And just to make life really easy, I'm gonna to come to my bounces folder, which I'm about to fill up with new files. And I'm gonna throw these away. I don't need those, I'm gonna move them to the bin. They're gone. Back into Logic. Okay, so option two would be that what I do is to create individual track prints from every single sound. What do I mean by that? Okay, well, let me solo the drums for a moment. What I'm gonna do is to select the drums, press solo, and I'm gonna put a loop around the active area of the track all the way to the end. And what I could do now would be to press the bounce button. I could create an offline bounce. And what I could do would be to press okay, and I could call this drums and I can press bounce. Now, what's gonna happen is that just that sound is going to get printed. Why would I do that when I've just established that one track being printed as part of a major group, as we did a moment ago, where we selected every single track and rendered them all one in one go, why would I do this? Painfully going through one track at a time to then label the next one and to call this one percussion so that this is the next sound that I print. Well. The reason why I might choose to do that comes down to those shared effects. Let's suppose that what I've done is to use the reverb on the drums and I've used it on the pianos and I've used it on the guitars, just like I said before. The problem with the stems that I created in the previous iteration when I printed the reverb was that if I've got a reverb file and it's being fed from three separate instruments, the track called reverb is going to contain the piano and the guitar and those drums all mixed together. So rather than the reverbs being accessed and printing three different files, because it's a shared reverb, there's no way that Logic knows to separate them. So the advantage of going one track at a time, if you want to include effects, is that because only one sound is soloed, the reverb that will get printed onto that file will only be triggered by that individual track. So if I've used a reverb on loads of different sounds and I don't want the reverb to be a smudge of all of those sounds playing back together, by selecting one sound at a time and using the offline bounce function, I'm gonna to have to sit here for as long as it takes me to select one track after another and it's slower and it's more painful. But if effects are a big part of my project and I've shared them across a number of sounds, that will provide me with the separation that I'm looking for. So that's the second way in which I can produce individual track bounces. Okay, I don't wanna do that either. I'm gonna come out of my solo mode. Again, I'm gonna come back into my bounces folder, select these two stems that I've just produced. And again, I'm gonna throw those away as well. That's not what I'm gonna do here either. 
the third option that I've got available to me. We've looked at two already. Here's the third option. And that is that I create stacks for all of the individual parts of my track. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to create a track stack. We know now that I can use what are called nested stacks within Logic, which means that even though my drums are a track stack, I can put that track stack in another stack with this percussion part, and I can call this drums. So that is all of the drums within my mix now folded down to this one place. What I'm then going to do is to take my keys, which are here. In fact, I'll use this track even though it's not active at the moment. And I'm going to call this one synths. So this is my next track stack. I'm just going to call this synths. I can close this down. Every time I close one down, I can see what I've already assigned. I'm going to put this next stack and I'm going to call it keys because these are the pianos and the piano chord parts and that kind of stuff. So that's going to be my keys stack. Then what I'm going to do is to create a basses one, which is these next two tracks here. This is the brass, and I'm going to put it in a stack even though it's just one track. We'll see why in just a moment. So there's my brass. And then I'm going to get rid of this vocal part because there aren't any vocals on that track. That's fine. That's come from a live loop session, which is why it's warning me about the cells. So it's, I've effectively just got rid of any of the vocals that were in the original live loop session, which triggered this project. So what I'm then going to do is to um, put together a guitar stem um, or track stack here. OK, so what I've now done is I put all of my mix into individual stem groups. Now then, I mentioned at the beginning, what does your collaborator want? And if your collaborator says, yeah, I just need all the drums together, and I need all the pianos together, and I need all the guitars together, it's fine. OK, well then fine. You don't need individual track prints. What you need is all of your individual parts folded down into different stems. And we can do that simply again by selecting these different groups. And when I come to the file menu this time, and I come down to export, what I've got a chance to do is to select six tracks as audio files. And these are my six separate stems. Now you'll notice that they don't include the reverb and the delay. Effectively what I'm doing is I'm choosing to omit those. They're not going to get printed as part of this process. But what I have now got is the opportunity to print these and export them again, just like I did before. And the other advantage of working this way is that I've now gone through all of the different instrument groups and I've named them, which means that rather than something being called Solaris, which isn't actually that helpful, I've got to play that file to find out that it's the drums. This time, because the drums are labeled drums, that's what that track is going to be called when I finish the export process. So again, I'm going to open up my bounces folder and this time I'm going to discover that these are labeled correctly. Again, I should just be able to drop them in place. I'm going to create new tracks for them. And again, I'm going to solo them. And again, probably we'll need to turn these down to make sure that they're not crazy loud. So let's come and find these tracks. And here they are. I'm going to just turn them down. And this time, again, I'll turn them down 9 dB. What we've effectively got is a group of sounds assigned to each individual bus. Now, the easiest one to hear that on is probably going to be the guitars because there were more tracks contributing to that. Let's listen to that one by itself. And usefully, there's a little bongo part in there as well, which is not what I intended. But nevertheless, we can see that that sound's obviously been assigned into the wrong group. Nevertheless, if we come back to the beginning, what we'll hear, hopefully, is exactly the same mix, but effectively now on a smaller range of instrument groups. OK, so there's the keys group all by itself. So this gives me a much more consolidated group of um, stems. I would definitely say if you're working with vocals and if you've got lead vocals and backing vocals, I would put those in separate stem groups. Again, whoever is collaborating with you would, is going to want those separately. But again, you can decide exactly how deep you want to go as far as stem creation is concerned. So let's look at the fourth way in which I could render down the individual track stacks of my mix into stems. I could record them live. 
Now, effectively, what that means is I need to create an audio track which is capable of receiving an input from each of these individual stems one at a time. In other words, I need an audio track that's going to be recording the drums and an audio track that's going to be recording the synths and one that's going to be recording the guitars. And for every stack that I want to be able to record, I need a new audio track. But where is it going to get its input from? OK, so in order to look at this, what we need to do is to go into the mixer. Now, by default, when I created my drum track stack, what it did was to route all of those sounds through to the stereo output. Makes sense. I want all of those tracks to reach that point. But if I want to, I can interrupt that process. I can send the sounds not just straight to the, an auxiliary, uh, sorry, not straight to the uh, stereo output. I can send them to an auxiliary. And we'll see why that's useful right now. What I'm going to do is to take my drums and I'm going to go looking for an auxiliary bus that I haven't used already. OK, I can see that bus 20 is available. Let's start with bus number 20, a nice round number. So when I select bus 20 as the output for my drums, I can see that a new auxiliary is created. And I'm going to call this drums return. Now, effectively, that means that my sounds from my drums are now being sent to this auxiliary bus and it is sending it onto the stereo output. So it's still going to sound exactly the same. But the advantage of having done that becomes clear when I create a new audio track. I'm going to drop down here to the bottom of my project, make everything a little bit smaller, and I'm going to create an audio track, a brand new one. And what I'm going to do is to set this up to receive an input from bus number 20. In other words, it's going to receive a signal from my drums return channel. So when I press create, what that's going to do is to create a new audio track. And I'm going to call this drums return as well. So in other words, this is going to be the recording of the drum return. Now, think about it. I need to record this in real time, which means when I do that, the drum track here is going to play and I'm going to hear it. So I don't need to hear the audio file that's being created as it plays back. I'm going to mute this channel and I'm going to press record. Now, if I drop to this section of my track, just to test this and to check that it's working, what I can do is to drop in, let's say, a bar before the drum start, and I'm going to press record and we'll see what happens. OK, now when I press stop, with any luck, if I unmute this channel and we just solo it, this should just be the drums. OK, so that's working for that channel. So what I would need to do now would be to create similar audio tracks for the other stems. So what I could do would be to move this drums return channel down to the bottom so it's out of the way. What I could then do would be to unsolo everything so I've got everything available. I'd come to my synths part and I'd repeat the process. So this one would need to go to the next available bus, which would be bus number 21. I could then label this synths return. And then what I could do would be to create a new audio track, which I can just do by double clicking underneath the first one. I need to make sure that its input is set up to receive the right bus, which is going to be my synth return, bus number 21. And that one is ready to record the synth return. I should label it so I know what it's going to be when I record and I'm in good shape. So in other words, I could go through and create a bus assignment for each of my stems and then create an audio track to receive an input from that bus number. So I need to match the return channels to the outputs for each individual one. Now, the advantage of having done that for all six of those tracks is that at the very end of that process, I can mute these, I can arm them so that they're ready to record. And then when I press record from the beginning, I can record all the way through the track and all of those individual stems will fold down to their own audio tracks. Now, it's really important that I record from bar one. Obviously, I need the whole track to record and I need all of those recordings to start at the same point. Again, I want to make sure that importing those files is really easy for whoever I'm giving my stems to. 
So within this video, we've taken a really deep dive into all of the ways that we can export tracks within our project so that we can collaborate with other people. We've looked at individual track export. We've looked at going old school and selecting one track at a time, the advantage of that being that any effects are printed one after another on each individual track. We've looked at the idea of creating track stacks for our mix and exporting those in one hit. And lastly, what we've done is to create auxiliary returns for those track stacks and then audio files which can receive an input from those auxiliaries. So effectively what we're doing is we're physically routing all of those track stacks onto their own audio tracks so that we can record them in one go. It's an awful lot of information within this video. So focus on each individual chapter, find the one that best suits your workflow. And if you need to, watch it a couple of times just so you can see exactly how I've created those effects. One way or another, you'll find the pathway that works for you in terms of sharing your files with whoever you're working with.